here we are again, round two, as it were. Um, the second episode of A Brief History of Everything. We were literally inundated with a piece of feedback. So, no, it was a little bit more than that, actually. It was quite quite a positive feedback. I am your host, Chris Buchanan, alongside me again, backed by popular demand. Um, was this, I don't know if the popular demand was the general population or him, but Thomas, me. good to see you again. Hello, yes. So, Thomas Ellie, back again for another another episode. So... The first episode seemed to go quite well. We got actually got some quite good feedback off that. It was very encouraging feedback. Thank you to everyone who took the time to uh, listen and uh, give us some words of encouragement, even uh, even those people who may not have particularly enjoyed what we had to say. Uh, they enjoyed the rigorous discussion and uh, in-depth soiree into history. And in particular, my placement of advertising which had no place anywhere because we're not sponsored by anyone so well, yes the sponsorships did not uh, sort of flow as willingly as i expected but after this episode i guarantee you they will i, I think a lot more references to things like bugatti for example i think that might that might be the angle we're looking for here bugatti uh, considering that uh, considering the topic of discussion for today is what is great i think there will be many many opportunities to uh get a sponsorship out of this so we're here to talk as as thomas just alluded to to the idea of the great through history and you know we've, we've heard a lot about this lately through making america great again um as <laughs> as donald trump would trump is want to say trump the great yes we're not actually going to go into that what we are going to look at though is we're going to spend a bit of time today just discussing people throughout history who have been called the great and it's 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 a title that can seem to be just sort of self, self-fulfilling. So, oh yeah, they're the great. Okay, well, they must have been wonderful. But as people who listen to the first podcast will understand, we're not going to just sit there and allow the term to sit there. We're sort of going to break that down and, and think about what does it actually mean to be the great? And and how does one define greatness? And, and is greatness always warranted? Now, one of the things that, we find through history is that a lot of the time people give themselves the title of the great yes it certainly does seem to be a self-anointed title a lot of the time um, which is probably something to explore in and of itself Um, what would be the reasons why a person gives themselves a title of the great while they're still alive what are the implications for that while they rule and lead but that might end up being a different discussion for a different time today i think what we want to really delve into is how has that title sort of lived up or been held up through history uh, by historians and students of history how is it that some people are still called the great and do they still warrant that title in today's context of historical analysis now just with um, this topic here much like the first topic all of these topics and questions have come up through my uh, year seven history class actually and the question of Has anyone ever deserved the title of the great? Which was raised due to their study of Egypt. And we'll get into that in a minute. What we're going to do, though, is we're going to break this podcast into a couple of of zones. The first thing we're going to do is talk about two people who are probably by consensus the great. Uh, Once we do that, we're each going to pick two people through history who have been regarded as the great. And we're either going to support them or we're going to sort of critique why they might have been the great and and how they might have been seen as being the great. Not surprisingly, Thomas's examples come from modern history. Of course. Uh, somewhat surprisingly, one of my examples is is ancient, and one of my examples is modern. So I'm sort of delving into mm. into Thomas's waters here. Uh, and then after that, we're actually going to pick one person each who was not known by the title of the great that we feel should be. Now, that'll be interesting in, in itself, and students of my classes will probably understand where I'm going to head with this. Um, it's probably going to be pretty obvious to them, but as I'm assuming that there's a large proportion of the listening audience that will never have been in one of my classrooms, some would say lucky, <laughs> then you're, you're going to be in for a bit of a, an interesting ride. So we're going to begin with the consensus. Now, when you think of the great... And, and when you say something the great, there are two names that really spring to mind. And we're going to start with the first one. And the first one we're going to start with is, of course, Alexander. 
So Alexander the Great, probably the consensus whenever you hear the word the great. Um, And I don't think either of us are going to have too much argument with the idea of Alexander. What do you think? I mean, I certainly agree that he is the, the person who springs to mind when you say so, so-and-so the great or does anyone deserve the title of the great. Not for any other reason other than the fact that um, his name is most synonymous with it. I mean, you you could ask anyone what was Alexander's last name and they would have said, was it the or great? Um, there's not really... That's his name, the Great Alexander the Great. When well, we all know it's of Macedon. Is yes, his last I mean name. he has plenty of other titles, and uh, Alexander of Macedon has probably just lost us a bunch of uh, listeners. But irrespective of that, the Great is is essentially his name, and so he sort of has this uh, monopoly over the title. Whereas some of the other people we will talk to you about uh, have different names and different titles, and are not always necessarily known as the Great. It's just a title that we um, agree as being conferred upon them or are about to critique. But with Alexander, there's there's no real argument about the fact that he is referred to as the great or that he has achieved great things uh, and that he is probably one of the greats. And I think that Alexander did a lot by self-publicity, which is, you know, all great leaders have the element of, of good publicity. Um, you need to have good publicity. That's that's how you convince people that you're as good as you claim you are. And, I mean, one of the, the greatest things I think that he did to, to perpetuate this is that, you know, every city that he settles is Alexandria. 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 Let, let's have another Alexandria. Let's let's just keep this going. And or again, his horse gets a, a shoe in every now and Bucephalus gets a, a couple of towns after his name, doesn't he? Yeah, exactly. And that, that's the point, is that he names everything, you know, so you, you have no doubt... As to whom was the conquering, conquering hero and whom was the person that, that all of this was, was thanks to. It was Alexander. And he, he puts his name on everything, um, quite cleverly so. And what you also have to go with on that is that he's probably one of the first people in history that actually has the right to put his name on everything, simply because of the conquest and the scale of the conquest. And I think that the scale of Alexander's conquest of what is at that time basically the known world is is incredible and i think it's something that is is worthy of the title the great yeah expanding a couple of islands and a peninsula out to being the dominant force in sort of uh, asia or at least uh, western asia middle east uh, the mediterranean i mean that that's no small feat especially when you do it from the back of a horse with an iron sword uh, and wearing a tunic these are the sorts of accomplishments that um, are most often associated with him. Now, anyone who's studied Alexander in, in, in a great degree of depth knows there's a lot more to what he did than just the military campaigns. And I think this is, for me, where the great um, is truly deserved. That um, To borrow a word from uh, sort of the Renaissance era, he's a polymath of politics and leadership. He, a polymath himself is a, or herself is a person who's quite skilled at a number of disciplines. So Leonardo da Vinci is often cited as a great polymath. Many of the Renaissance artists and thinkers and writers are polymaths. But if we borrow that term to apply it to leadership, it's a leader who isn't just great at war, but they're also good at administration of um, character measurements, who to put around themselves, um, you know, the diplomacy of expanding an empire, all of these sorts of things are what makes a great leader. And this is where we get Alexander the Great. He establishes an empire, not just through conquest, but through great administration. And I think that's something that there's a lot to be spoken for that. I mean, after he dies, is also very interesting with regards to that administration because, you know, Alexander puts his key generals and basically divvies up the world between them. And says you can have this bit here, and you can have this bit here, and you can have this bit here, and that's the way that he sort of set it up. But it was it was very clever the way he did that because he wasn't reliant on one person. Mm. He had a very strong group of people working with him, whom he knew that when he was off conquering, you know, the next big territory, he could leave people behind to run things and administer things, mm. and mm. everything would happen as he wanted it to happen. And it's very rare that most of the time in, in history, the second that somebody comes in and claims an area and then moves on to the next area, 
that area they've just claimed tends to fall into turmoil. I think, obviously, I think back to you know the running battle of the Crusades, mm. where they'd they'd sweep in, they 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 make a town Christian, and then as the second they leave again, it reverts back, and we we end up with this never ending cycle of didn't we just conquer this? Let's conquer it again. Let's conquer it again. There's only so many times you can conquer Constantinople. It's just, <laughs> after a while, it's, it's just no challenge anymore. But one of the things that Alexander does quite quite well is he makes sure that everywhere he conquers sort of falls into a very stable environment. And it's there's not really chaos and bedlam left behind Alexander. And for someone who's conquering everything as they move through, that's very clever. Absolutely. I think we take for granted... Uh, in a modern context, uh, the notion that when a leader changes, the, the nation or the state remains. But in these ancient times, when a place was conquered and, and a person died, a leader died, and I think this will become very apparent when we talk about another of our consensus figures, when that person dies, it's not usually as a ticking clock for the sort of um, falling apart of that empire if another strong person doesn't take over. With Alexander, um, he dies... Uh, and the empire remains. It wasn't built necessarily around him. It was built around success. And as long as people were still successful or successful people uh, were put in charge, the empire remained uh, stable to a degree. Now, obviously, um, you know, it has its contractions and its divisions and what have you, but it, it takes the Roman Empire to defeat the Greek Empire, which is another of the great... Uh, empires throughout history. And the Romans obviously looked up to I mean Polybius opens his histories account recounting the stories of Alexander and mm. the achievements of Alexander mm. and most of the Roman emperors that were to come along looked at Alexander as a model of how to do things. And you can sort of see a large element of Alexander in things like Pax Romana and things like that that it, it comes across as the the way to govern through peace, you know, the Roman peace. It f- fits a lot of Alexander and the thing we always have to, and it always gets mentioned, but the reason it always gets mentioned is because it's, for me, the most fascinating part of the story, is that by the time, when, when he basically conquers the largest breadth of this empire, he's 30. Mm. You know, I've barely got my life together and I'm 33. So by 30, he conquered most of the known world. So I've got a few months until I'm 30, so, but I've got, a, I've got a plan. Next school holidays, that's when it's happening. Colonization starts next holidays. Yeah, next holidays. Okay, so we, we may not be recording podcasts next holidays because well, we, we do it. We're doing it on the road. Oh, we can take the show. We can take the show on the road. Conquering all these places. I think we can do that. Thomasville. Quite easily. Thomasville. Thomas Town. Thomas Town. Whether well, it is or is already a Thomas Town, but that's oh. that's a different story. Well, we'll reconquer it and rename it Thomas Town. But Alexander the Great actually leads us in quite quite well for me. For the other person that I always associate with, the Great. And the reason it leads us in quite nicely is because Alexander, one of, for me, one of Alexander's strongest conquests is Egypt. And when he conquers Egypt, and obviously the Ptolemaic pharaohs from his main general Ptolemy um, follow afterwards, and that's the last great sort of era of, of, of Egypt in that, that regard, leading to Cleopatra, who everyone believes is Egyptian. She's Greek, Greek. but we won't get into that. Or Macedonian. We won't get into the Greek Macedonian thing. I, I, I love all my listeners. I don't care what background you're from. But Alexander conquers Egypt, and that leads to the first great person for me, which is Ramesses the Great. Now, Ramesses the Great is where sort of this podcast today gets its start, because in Egypt, Egypt in year seven, we actually asked the question for my year seven class of was Ramesses the Great truly great? And they actually have to discuss whether they thought Alexander, whether they thought Ramesses deserves the title of the Great. And it was really interesting to see. Now, with, with, with Ramesses the Great, or Ramesses the Second, now let's give him his proper title, there's a number of factors that go into play with Ramesses. The first being that he's about 91 when he dies. Still young. You're looking at, in Egypt, with that period of time and that lifespan, up to three, possibly stretching into the fourth level of generations that don't know anyone other than Ramesses in charge. They legitimately think he's a god. They think he's been forgotten. They Probably think that he's himself is a god. Well, he, by this point, wouldn't you? He's 91. And and far more importantly, from my Year 7 students' point of view and the thing that they always take with them, over 100 children. Let's just 
let that rest for a minute. I actually showed uh, Thomas before one of my favorite websites, which is the Theban Mapping Project, which shows you the Valley of the Kings and all the tombs in the Valley of the Kings. And the largest tomb in the Valley of the Kings is dedicated to the children of Ramesses II. Not Ramesses II, the children, because he outlives a huge proportion of them. And is actually one of the reasons why Egypt falls into a bit of turmoil, is that the number of Ramesses' children, who all think they should be next in line, is, is quite great. But with Ramesses the Great, it's very hard for some people to think of massive achievements. I mean, if I say Ramesses the Great, where do you go with that? For me, it's... Um... It, it, it illustrates a point of context. Ramsay's achievements for his time, being in the well into the thousand BCs, for his time is extreme. is is quite exceptional, especially considering that the nature of ancient Egypt. They're relying on this one river, so anything that they achieve is going to be in relativity to this river. So how far can they expand? That's all going to be dictated by supply lines and trade routes. His ability to expand Egypt further south, further west, further east, further north, and create what we think of as that Egyptian empire in its glory days, that golden era. That, that's a, a great achievement for that context. Now, is it as expansive or as great as Alexander? No, um, which might give Alexander a foot up, but let's you know, take them in their context. What did Alexander have that Ramses didn't have? And I think when you nut down into that, you find that Ramses' achievements were off a similar scale, although proportionately smaller, to Alexander and probably gives him a, a legitimate claim to being the great. Well, so the thing, the thing for me with, with, with Ramses is that if you have a look at Ramses the Great and what he actually does achieve, his, his strongest achievement is a peace treaty. His absolute strongest achievement is his peace treaty. And the peace treaty is something that he's forced into off the back of bad military decisions. You know, he makes a terrible series of calls against the Syrian army, leading to him almost being captured and killed, leading to possibly the greatest inscription in the history of Egypt, where Ramesses tells everybody that he has single-handedly defeated the Syrians on the back of his chariot, sword, bow and arrow, riding the chariot, his armies running away, but Ramesses bravely steaming through the middle of them. The accounts we have that actually talk about what happened during that, that conflict seem to indicate that Ramesses was deceived by an enemy spy who said they're nowhere near, lulled him into the trap. His army told him not to go. He rode off ahead of them. He got surrounded with him and his guards. He was in a lot of trouble. He'd sent another group of soldiers up the riverbank to try to sort of head them off. They happened to wash ashore and spot the battle. And when they came in from the side, the Syrians weren't sure if it was a trap or not and rode off. And that sort of saved Ramesses. And it was after that, and they, the, the next couple of battles, after the Battle of Kadesh, obviously, where both sides sort of looked at the situation and went, we can't win this. And it was in everyone's interest to sign a peace treaty. And it's the first peace treaty ever signed. And on that, in that regard, it's actually, that is a big step forward in diplomatic ties. It's a big step forward in the way that nation states are going to start handling their business. You've now got a situation where there are peace treaties. This is no longer a God is on our side and we will win this battle or die trying. There is now an option of we agree we're just going to stop. And I think that makes him the great. His building achievements are quite impressive. I don't necessarily consider them on the par of some other pharaohs, though. That, I think, for me, works a little bit against him. I think the, the greatness comes in a period of peace and prosperity that is huge for a, a single pharaoh, and especially a pharaoh that rules from his early teens into the age of about 91. I think that gives him some scope to be called the great. We talk about, we talked about it before. The great seems to be associated a lot with military achievement. I think that successful peace can garner you the title of the great as well. And I think with, with Ramesses, you see that. Mm, I would agree definitely that um, greatness can come from um, you know, civility or peacefulness. Um, that's one thing I think we will talk a lot about in our 
two chosen sort of pseudo case studies. One thing that lends uh, Ramsey's to being the great for me is that he's a very early prototype of what you might call a neuron dictator, but he uses the features of what um, you know people like Stalin, Hitler, Mao, Mussolini all evoke in their cult of personality. So Ramsey is, is probably one of those first people, much like Alexander did as well, um, who uses this phenomenon known as a cult of personality, which is where you get the population to believe in the personality. The greatness of the nation comes from the greatness of the personality or the person leading it. The success and the rise and fall of a nation is attached to this person. This person is more than just a leader. They are you know, a savior in a sense. And Ramses, he puts his face everywhere. He uses the elements of propaganda, um, which is one of those key parts of being a colder personality. He resets the calendar to coincide with his date. Now, that's not unique to him, but it is another element that he's looked back at ancient history and said, well, how can I make myself integral to uh, Egypt? So I will make every year coincide with the age of my you know, life. So year one is now my first year. And so Egypt is aged to him. His face is everywhere. So the people get a sense of ownership. He forces himself into the civilian's life. And in that way, he's able to demonstrate this very great awareness of politics. He's able to demonstrate or round out his great leadership capacities. He's not just a military leader, but he's also acutely aware of politics. And as you said before, he's a great leader in diplomacy. And so we see this variety of leadership. And again, that's a leader who, for me, earns a title great. Someone who's skilled in a variety of areas of leadership. And I think the fascinating part as well with with Ramesses in that regard is that you can't you can't penalize somebody for just having longer to do something. Mm. And like I can't penalize Ramesses simply because he just happens to have longer than anyone else to do what he did. For example, putting your face everywhere was the trade of all pharaohs. All pharaohs took names off walls and put their name on them. They changed statues to say it was them. Ramesses just has a lot longer to do it. Do it. And you can't you can't critique him for that. I don't think you can criticise Ramesses for doing that. So I think that Alexander the Great and Ramesses the Great, I think both meet anyone's criteria to be called the Great. To be called the Great in an ancient context. I don't think that had they done their actions in a modern context, I don't think they necessarily would have been the Great. For example, if Alexander was expanding this Greek empire in the same uh, way as, say, Queen Victoria was. Now, we don't attach the, the, the term the great to Queen Victoria, yet she built the biggest empire, uh, or she oversaw the greatest expansion of the British Empire and, and uh, sort of administered the biggest empire the world's ever seen. She's not called the great. Now, Alexander's context and Ramsay's context gives them the authority to claim the great, but outside of that context would they be the great maybe not in a modern sense no and i think the con- context is something that you're going to hear a lot about on these podcasts because mm. we're, we're very big on that and and there's going to be in a couple of podcasts time there will be a bit more of a discussion related to napoleon bonaparte mm. Mm. and i've had this discussion with, with with thomas in the lead into these things that there's lots of napoleonic era stuff that contextually nowadays can be pilloried but at the time was revolutionary, you know, not not to use the, the idea of the French Revolution as a pun, <laughs> but it was actually revolutionary thinking of its day, but nowadays would be seen as being highly outdated. Mm. But so, so Something like social Darwinism, you yeah. know, in a context that was considered progressive thinking, and yet now we just see it as pseudo-racism. Not even pseudo-racism, it was just straight-out racism. racism. And, and again, context. things like eugenics that link eugenics. into Eugenics. But we'll come back to those points in future podcasts, because we now need to move on past our two consensus picks. Now... Before we get into us picking and defending, I figured that we should include some of those titles that we um, we just find amusing, not the great so much. And it, for me, there is only one title that in history has stuck with me, and it's Ethelred the Unready. Forget the great. Don't you want to go down in history as an unready? No, don't you want to be one of his issue, the next one of the unreadies? You know, go go to Castle Unready... It's not quite done yet. The gate's not up. Front wall's missing a bit. Um, there's no food really in there. All those sorts of things. I think the castle unready is castle unready is a, is a wonderful concept. 
It is a very peculiar, uh, peculiar name, and it's one of those long traditions of those um, sort of nobility um, getting ascribed a name off the back of their achievements or lack of achievements, as it would be with uh, the unready. Um, I think <laughs> strong. Uh, there's a strong argument to uh, take out of this, which is you've got to be very careful in believing the hype or the anti-hype. What's the opposite to hype? Let's just go with anti-hype. Anti-hype. Off, uh, that, that names tend to ascribe. So when we say someone is the great, you must question that the same way you need to question someone being called the unready. Who has ascribed that name to them? Who has first coined it? Was it a person saying it about themselves? I strongly doubt he was calling himself the unready. Well, there was, there was you know, a, a, a leader who was referred to as, you know, the cabbage. Um, <laughs> And the reason he was called the cabbage was simply because that they were trying to attach him to the, attach him to the lower classes to show that he didn't really have the ability to lead. So they referred to him as the cabbage. There was, I'm not going to use the term they came up with, but there was the one leader who, when he was in the baptismal font being baptized, went to the bathroom, and so that st- that name stuck with him. Um, you know, again, look it up yourself, kids. Um, look up the censored version of it, kids, because you know I don't encourage swearing on this podcast. It's a PG no. podcast. But I think that the, the title, and this is where, why I think we need to just mention those, the title that someone gives you, you know, if someone gives it to you or you give the title to yourself, it says a lot about you, it says a lot about the situation that you find yourself in. You know, Ethelred the Unready was very young when he took the throne. Um, people who call themselves the great a lot of the time are trying to publicize themselves to prevent internal enemies from taking control. Um, or in Ramesses' case, you were probably alive so damn long that you just ran out of things to call yourself. <laughs> um, and that's always an option. I think one great example of when you need to be careful of names is any of the North Korean dictators. <laughs> any of any them. of the Kims. There, any of them. Uh, you just have to take a look at the long, long list of glorious names for glorious leaders I of think North Korea. Kim Jong-il had something like 52 of them. It was something close to that. Yeah. Kim Jong-un's got more of them. They're all hereditary, this necropracy, uh, whatever it is, uh, wherein the first leader is still the leader. Even though di- he died, um, he's still in charge. Uh, such is his um, sort of power. He can rule from beyond the grave. Uh by the way, we are now officially banned from ever travelling to North Korea by having questioned the um, legitimacy of these titles and their achievements and their uh, leadership. And that sort of just goes even further to point out you've got to question these titles to be a good student of history. So basically, the brief hist- the brief history of everything podcast tour in the next holidays when Thomas is, of course, conquering the world, we'll have to bypass North Korea until he conquers it. Yes. So, and then unfortunately, I will take those fifty-two titles, and I will be glorious leader of the revolution. All of all of those people in Pyongyang who listen to us, and I know we have a very high listenership in Pyongyang. Um, hello, Supreme Leader, um, and and good good graces to you. All of those listeners, unfortunately, we will not be at your single shopping centre. Um, <laughs> we will not be at your single shopping centre buying your one stream of lettuce. Um, by the sounds of the way that food is going in your country, neither are you. So let's move on. And let's start on defending our turf, as it were. And, of course, Thomas has, has, has the floor. And the modern historian that, that Thomas is, he went with someone ancient, didn't you? You went, you went really old. Yeah, yeah, of course. So I went with uh, Frederick the Great, who was <laughs> such a long, long time ago in the 1700s, uh, back in the 18th century, is, is getting into those early days of modern history, which is where real history starts. For the ancient historian in me, I'm feeling like Frederick the Great ruled last week. <laughs> um, I picked Frederick the Great mainly because... He was modern. Uh, not just because he was modern. It did have something to do with it. But mainly because he, for me, is that prototype, and I think I've uh, used this phrase in our discussions prior to recording this, he's that prototype for the... European leader that will rise in all these different countries at different times for the next some 200 years. He is the Napoleon before Napoleon. He is the uh, Bismarck before Bismarck. He is the Stalin before Stalin. Um, Trump before Trump. The Trump before Trump. God, he'll be rolling in his grave if he heard that. Um, 
primarily because Freddie the Great encouraged thinking as opposed to Trump who encourages nothing. Just an absence of thought. Business. <laughs> Business. Um, so Frederick the Great, uh, also known as the King of Prussia, which is an important title to deconstruct in and of itself. Um, prior to Frederick the Great, there was no King of Prussia. There was a King in Prussia because no one had yet unified Prussia as a sovereign state, one might say. Um, he was the first person to do that. Now, Prussia, for all those people thinking, is not some sort of jutting out of Russia that was its own independent place. Uh, it was a nation uh, which went on to become a major part of Germany. And it is uh, in that north uh, eastern part of Europe, uh, towards the coastline up in the north. And Prussia, on the basis of Frederick the Great's achievements, uh, becomes a significant player. And you can trace a direct line between Frederick the Great's, Frederick the Great's achievements as a uh, in unifying Prussia to the formation of Germany to what would come as a result of Germany being in Europe. Now, without using that as a critique and not going too much further than that, the emergence of Prussia as a world power is of great importance in the 17 and 1800s. It becomes the third pillar, or maybe the fourth pillar, that Europe is built upon. You've got Britain and France, who are the ancient and traditional powers. Russia had emerged... And now here came Prussia uh, as a fourth uh, strong man in uh, Europe. And it largely came off the back of Austria uh, and the failing Ottoman Empire, which is in Europe at the time. Now, the term, the term that gets used with Frederick a lot is one of my favourite, is legitimately one of my favourite historical terms ever, which is enlightened absolutism. Ah, very important concept for any modern historian. So so just for, for those listening in, the idea of absolutism and and the word enlightenment doesn't seem to go with that concept. It seems to almost be an oxymoron. So feel free, please, to... So it's, it's essentially an intelligent dictator. That, that would be one way to think of it. It is a... The absolutism is the absolute power instilled in the top. So when you think of the social hierarchy, the social pyramid, you're really talking about the power at the top of that pyramid. So the power of law, legislation, social and civil rights is instilled in that very top ruling elite, and depending on how powerful your leader would be, um, would be the king. Now, the Enlightenment, or the enlightened part, is the, the, the strangest part, because Enlightenment at this time meant, you know, a progressive thinker, a intelligent thinker, a well-versed thinker, a well-rounded thinker, not a person who rules on a whim and a prayer, but a person who rules based on logic, and reason as they see fit. Uh, and so it's really the promotion of a dictator or a dictatorship, but ruling as they, as logic and reason would dictate to improve the social conditions of the time. That's at least my sort of very basic uh, explanation of it. I think it's not a bad basic explanation, but I think the thing for me with, with Frederick is making Prussia that fourth pillar making Prussia into the power that it sort of became. And, and again, my one of my areas in modern that I am very au fait with is the Napoleonic era of France. And without stretching too far into, into future podcasts, Prussia becomes very important when it comes to the future of Napoleonic France mm. in particular. And it's, it's one of, if not the key ally in that grand coalition that's that's brought up against Napoleon Bonaparte. Yeah, there's a number of times Prussia sort of is that swinging factor between win and loss for a number of sides, especially for England. Without Prussia, I don't think you see the evolution of uh, Great Britain and the British Empire as you actually um, sort of experience it over the next 200 and years. And you could probably suggest that it was the influence of of Frederick and that early relationship with, with Britain that then gets sort of called upon later on in, in with elements of World War Two where the, some of the Germans believed that the British would side with Germany long term and that they were natural allies. And a lot of that, I think, harks back to the days of Frederick the Great and establishing Prussia's role within that and the grand alliance with Britain that came out of that. Yeah, the, the Anglo-German relations are, are really established with Frederick the Great and so it really is like an Anglo, Anglo-Prussian uh, alliance, which ultimately is drawn on by the 
hopes off the military establishment in Nazi Germany that uh, England really, they're not going to come in the side of France. They've hated them more than they've liked them. They'll be on the side of the, you know, the shared history of the Anglo-Saxons and the, the alliances we've had during the Seven Years' War and against Napoleon. They're really sort of banking on a, an interpretation of history that doesn't exist, mine, mainly because the Nazis had no idea about what was happening in history. It was all just a reinterpretation of history, which does complicate Frederick's um, historical representation because he was so heroic to the Nazis um, in post-Nazi or post-World War II history. He's actually like given a really hard time and, and shuffled under the rug um, up until more recent times. Uh, he was sort of considered the forefather of uh, the Kaisership and from the Kaisership the Nazi dictatorship and from there we know what happens under both the Kaisership and the um, and the Nazis. And it's one of those it's one of those problems where but through no fault of their own, you know, the Nazis adopting something automatically then makes that, that item or that person mm. or that, that era a target because the Nazis consider something good automatically. And again, it's one of those things where in history, we always caution that you take everything on merit and take everything on the evidence. Don't take it off hearsay or someone else's point of view. And it quite often gets raised, for example, that Adolf Hitler disliked fox hunting and a was vegetarian. a vegetarian. Yeah. And the idea of, well, therefore, those All things... All vegetarians you know, must be evil. Ex- exactly. And, you know, while I think anyone that, that dines on a meal of kale Grass. and quinoa just as their meal could be looked at as some form of evil... Um, I don't necessarily think they're going to megalomaniac territory, so no. I, I don't buy into that. The same way that I don't buy because Adolf Hitler admired Frederick the Great, I don't buy into the fact that that necessarily makes him an evil bastard. Mm. It, just, it just doesn't do it. Just as a very short aside here, it's that's the trouble with the Nazis and post-Nazi Germany. Like, without... The Nazis' experiments and venturing into rocket technology, we don't land on the moon in the 1960s. The the Nazis had the most advanced scientific research program when it came to uh, rockets and uh, V1s and V2s are the best examples of it. The Americans come in and sort of... Well, the Americans and Russians divide between. Yeah, well, take some, you take some. And these are all Nazi scientists. The Americans were just lucky they got Werner von Braun. Yes. Uh, And consequently, you go, okay, oh, the Nazis are horrible. But then there's this problematic part where you go, well, based off some of the things some Nazis have done, our society has, in a way, benefited from it. And this is the problem with looking at history with just a fixed lens. You have to be much more flexible in your approach to history. And that's not to say you need to go in with an open mind about Nazis. Nazis were horrible. No one's going to stand up for the Nazis. They were genuinely terrible uh, people. But... On the backside of that, you've got the um, war is the necessity, war is the conditions where inventions are made that really advance society, and you have this very complicated relationship with all bad and good things in history. Yeah, exactly, and I think I think that's something that we'll we'll address in in upcoming um, editions of the pod, obviously. Which moves me on now to, and I've got a link. I can link between our two, and, and the link is Voltaire, oh, one of the great thinkers. Voltaire, one of the great thinkers of his and indeed any age. And the reason why I can link to that is that the person that I'm going to take up is is a modern person. I'm muddying the waters. I am breaking from type. Don't panic, I'll end up back in type very shortly. <laughs> but I'm going to break with type because I think Catherine the Great deserves some discussion. And and Catherine Catherine's fascinating. And I think that Catherine the Great is, is referred to as the great for a number of reasons. I mean, the obvious reason is that she was, you know, married to Peter the Great. And again, much like we joked about Alexander's last name being the Great, um, if you're Catherine and your husband's referred to as Peter the Great, hi, I'm Catherine the Great. You're not going to say I'm Catherine the Slightly the Okay <laughs> or the Wife of Great or used to be married to that guy who was great. Artist, no, or or artist it, formerly known as Great. Or, or in her case... You know, the fact that she had her husband probably killed. Although, again, you can never pin it down on her, but she does seem to be the person that benefits from his death. So I think that that's important. With regards to Catherine the Great, um, that's tea pouring, by the way, if anyone's wondering what that that liquidy noise was. Um, No wine tonight. Today it's far too early for that. Um, We're recording at tea time. We're not recording at after dinner time. 
T2 looking for a sponsorship. Yeah, in, in this case, he is. But the interesting part about Catherine the Great to start with is that she's not Russian. She's a Russian leader. She she runs Russia. She rules Russia, and she's sort of Prussian, basically. She's yeah, she's Prussian. She's sort of born between like that Germanish, Polandish sort of bit there, the main heart of Prussia there. She converts the Russian Orthodox Church. She marries Peter, not so much because she loves him, but she sees opportunity. And she seizes opportunity. And in that regard, and in that political manoeuvre alone, I think she earns the title of the Great just off the back of that. That's incredibly clever, incredibly astute. Um, and I think that if a male ruler had, had done something similar and manoeuvred that, they would be fated across the ages as a great tactician. Mm. Whereas some historians do argue that Catherine is just an opportunist. And I fail to see that. I see her as the great tactician. She sees an opportunity that I can get control here, I can get some power, I can get some influence, and goes for it. And I think that that, that sort of ruthless nature um, does propel her sort of into the realm of of greatness as it were and especially to rule and again you've got elizabeth the first obviously with in, in england who who rules as a woman but there's the female ruler and the strong female ruler has sort of been very sporadic over time and i think what what catherine manages to do is carve out in in one of the grand empires we're not talking about a smaller nation we're not talking about some isolated client state of a, of a Britain or of a Prussia. We are talking about Russia. We are talking about, as Thomas mentioned before, one of the four pillars of Europe. She rules it, and she's ruling it in her own right. There's nobody propping her up in terms of some power behind the throne. She's running the show. And I think with Catherine, that's a very important thing. She does move some social reform. In Russia, that's tricky to do. It could be argued that a lot of her social reform is not intended. Uh, her main social reform is that she allows for the serfs, the, 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 the peasant sort of slave class in, in, in Russia, she allows the serfs to have some bureaucratic basis. They can now go and appeal if they're not being treated well by their masters. They can go and appeal this and go through processes to have this dealt with. Now, on one hand, you go, well, that's good. She's giving them rights. Well, the previous strategy was that you had to go and appeal directly to Catherine, Catherine the Great. And Catherine did not want to deal with the peasant classes. Who would? So, exactly. If you've got the opportunity to lock yourself in a tower away from everybody, why would you want to deal go with away, those? Go away, plebs. Go away. Low life scum. Leave me alone. I'm here ruling Russia. I have Fabergé eggs. I believe that's uh, Malcolm Turnbull's next speech <laughs> in one of his lines in his victory speech, which is coming any day now, will be... Thank you, plebs, for your votes. We are, we are recording, by the way, and the Australian election is still not decided, um, just to give you a heads up. But Catherine sort of does end up reforming things, but then takes it back. As she gets older, and as a lot of people do when they get older, they get more conservative. And she goes very conservative because there's a couple of attempts to overthrow her, mostly from the peasant classes. Because funnily, funnily enough, the peasants who don't have anything are very upset with the ruler who has everything, who thinks that the peasants complain and should just get back to the field. And so what ends up happening is that Catherine works out that the ruling classes around her are the ones who have the power to keep her in power. So she basically retracts on everything she said about the serfs and allows that the ruling classes may make all the decisions. And that puts the, the, the serfs into a worse position than they were in when she actually came to power. So I think for, for, for Catherine, it's it's somewhat checkered. It's, there's no great social reform that's bold and moving forward, even though, as we mentioned on the last podcast, people, after she dies, yearn for a return back to her progressive Russia, which gives you an idea of what her son did. And, and and the other thing to mention there with her son is that she is a pretty good judge of character because she went out of her way as she realised that she was going to die shortly. 
she went out of her way to try to find somebody else to rule to rule Russia. She went out of her way to find Real another heir. Yeah. She was trying to find advisors to take control of the situation. She really didn't want her son to rule, and that was reflected in the fact that he comes to power and very short time is killed. And as we said in the last podcast, no one is even remotely dealt with. Um, Russia just moves on. So I think she's done enough to earn the title of the great. I think that she's a textbook case of the ability and power being enough to be the great. But in terms of as a social progressive or as any major social change, she doesn't really meet that brief. I think Catherine the Great, for me, is the great... (laughs) is the point at which... I was going to say the great point is the point at which you can start to see a difference between what is an ancient or classical the great and what is a modern the great. No longer in uh, the modern era are we saying, oh, someone who leads from the front, a real warlord or a guy or a girl or a man or a woman with a sword in their hand and a shield in their other riding on the back of a horse, these aren't the great people. We look towards politics, we look towards social reform, we look towards rights, we look look towards freedoms. And I know that there'll be someone that we discuss that does break that trend, but when we look at Ramses and Alexander, these are warriors fighting, expanding, doing crazy, bloodthirsty things. When we look at Frederick, when we look at Catherine, we look at people who are making legislative and social changes and and holding them up as going great you're improving human condition this is what makes you a good person and a great leader cyrus is going to be a different example yep uh he will break that trend but i think the three modern examples show us that the modern greats are different measurements of the ancient greats which goes back to what i was saying with alexander and i think we need to move into now your second great and your second grade is actually one that I, I didn't think of at the time. And when you mentioned your second grade to me, I was actually genuinely thrilled to see that you'd mentioned, mentioned this second grade because I'd done some study on this person at university in particular and I was always fascinated by the era. And I think that the other thing is too, these, these podcasts and, and history in general has traditionally been Eurocentric. Yeah, I and think... what I like about where we're about to go is that we're finally dealing with Asia. Is uh, all those places in history that people tend to think they know a lot about, but the modernisation process is something that I find not many people uh, are particularly no- uh, knowledgeable about, at least in an in-depth way. So, Emperor Meiji is central to the modernisation of Japan. It's under his reign; it goes from being a feudal society where you know, the samurai are the one of the, the example of the most technologically advanced uh, people to a place uh, or a nation that is building an empire and defeating European nations at war. And this all happens in a period of some 30, 40 years. So Meiji comes to the uh, imperial throne in Japan off the back of a series of um, sort of uh, peasant family rebe- rebellions. Um, he is placed into a place of greater power than previous emperors. Um, before Meiji, the emperor had become largely a symbol of power but had no actual power. The Tokugawa shogun would have had all the power. The Tokugawa shogun is overthrown. That is the, the shogun, or the, you might think of it as the main advisor to the emperor who was dictating how Japan would sort of develop and progress. They had imposed a great sense of isolationism now, isolationism, where you, cunt, uh, where you uh, cut off your country from the rest of the world. And what had happened was Japan had progressed for 300 years without any outside contact with any other nation. Meiji comes to the throne and removes this um, policy of isolationism, largely off the back of uh, threats from America, telling them that they have to uh, open up to the rest of the world. Once they do that, Uh, Meiji and his advisors realize that there's no way uh, Japan is going to stay free and independent if they don't modernize. They look at China, which is being carved up uh, by the European powers. Uh, Hong Kong's been taken by Britain. Parts of the Shanghai and Beijing ports have been taken by Germany and France. Um, 
Macau has been taken by the Portuguese, and now all these European nations are moving inland of China. They look at China and say, we don't want this uh, progress. It is just going to sort of carve us up in the same way. So we need to find a way to avoid um, turning into China. So what the Meiji does is he sends out, and these are fascinating sources to read. He sends out all of these scholars from Japan and says, you go to America, you go to Britain, you go to Germany, you go to Russia, you go all over the world and just write down everything you see, talk to everyone, observe, what does it mean to be a modern nation? What do we need to do to avoid a fate like uh, China? And these Thousands and thousands of books keep getting sent back by the day of all these scholars who are traveling all throughout the world and observing these things. And from them, a number of ideas are distilled. So the scholar who goes to America says, well, we need a thing called a constitution and we need a body of governance and a representative body of governance. And the scholar who goes to Germany says we need a strong military. The scholar who goes to Britain says we need an empire. And all these people are observing what it means to be a modern nation. And they come back and Meiji oversees this modern nation, modernization process called uh, you know, the Meiji Restoration and then following on from that, uh, the modernization of Japan. Japan, in a period of 30 to 40 years, goes from being you know, Dark Ages style Europe to being able to compete with all of these nations. Now, if you want to see a, a, an average movie which depicts some of this, <laughs> The Last Samurai is a great example. Um, Tom Cruise, if you can stand him, is this uh, American who goes to Japan and oversees part of the modernization of the military. But be aware that it's not just the military that's modernizing. This is uh, a whole society that is modernizing and doesn't rebel against it because the leader sets an example. So Meiji starts wearing European-style clothing. He starts using European-style uh, politics. He starts using European-style titles and nobility titles. He starts engaging in European diplomacy. And all of these modernizing features uh, are just accepted by the Japanese people. There are, of course, the, the minority who have a problem with it, and there's often some social fragmentation. But on the whole, Japan is united and brought into the modern era under the reign of Meiji. The social reform is unparalleled. You can't find an example of this anywhere else in the world of a nation going from nothing to something in a period of you know, half a century. I think it's, it's, it's interesting in terms of, from a social standpoint, it's the first time that anyone really breaks down what it means to be a modern nation. And I think the fact that it was done so clinically and one person just went, let's let's go do this. You go do this, you go do this. Let's come back. It's it's an original sort of think tank without the ridiculous names like Blue Sky Sessions and things like that. <laughs> um, and it's a very clever way of, of, of working out, okay, what exactly do our, we want our country to be? It's the modern equivalent of, you know, a business gets everyone in the room and puts a whiteboard up and goes, right, what should this business be? Go, write it on the board. Um, but rather than you know, said buzzwords, they've got research and actual actual ideas, actual ideas being undertaken. Uh, incidentally, by the way, just apologies for the sound of the buffeting trucks. We are we apparently are are having trucks that have decided that they're going to deliver to like every house around where we're recording. So, but that'll all be fixed up in in future podcasts. So, if you can hear lots of trucks in the background, we haven't started the moving podcast no, just no, yet. Not yet. Not yet. Um, Shh, don't tell it's, them. It's 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 coming though, right? The the, the, the travelling truck will be here shortly. <laughs> so, but no, I think the, you're right. The Meiji Meiji Restoration, I think, is is a very it's pivotal to modern history. Mm, mm, I think mm. extremely pivotal to modern history, especially for countries like Australia. I think the the Meiji Restoration has huge implications, and for colonialism, I think too. I think um, without. Without Meiji leading the the modernization process, even if you have another leader, Meiji was the person setting the example. He showed it's okay to wear these clothes. It's okay to think of yourself like this. It's uh, his the Constitution of Japan was a gift, and that's what it was presented as publicly. This is a gift from Meiji to you, the people. And when you start talking about change as a gift and leading by example, you are inherently going to get more people to support this change. When you have uh, Meiji sending messages on telegraph wires, 
you are going to get people thinking, okay, this isn't so scary. When your leaders lead by example, then you will often have people who would be resistant to change coming along with you. And that's obviously something we, we lack in the modern times. Leaders very rarely lead by example, but Meiji leads change by example. And in Japan, while he's alive, he earns the title of the great. It's not a title given to him by historians who sit back and go, hmm, yes, as they stroke their chin. Yes, he's, he's actually been quite good. Let's give him a title. He earns it from the people at the time. Now, a historian... Uh, who's much more versed in the major restoration may question the centrality or some of the narrative that I've just told. But I think he is central to all of the changes that come, at least in a, if not in a tangible way, in a symbolic way. And that for me um, earns him the title of great. Japan changes, it changes for the better. Um, I'm probably going to get hate mail about what happens in the 1920s and 30s. That's not under Meiji. Under Meiji, we have a time where Japan is prosperous, expanding. Yes, they are aggressive. Yes, they are acting in ways that we condemn Western societies for. And I would condemn Japan straight away for some of the actions that they do. But the total picture of change that comes in Japan under Meiji, I think, earns the title of the great. And that's one of the things we said. They didn't necessarily have to be the greatest moral compass person mm -hmm. in the world. Having said that, I'm now about to take us into that territory. I'm about to take us into somebody who, in ancient times, decreed that they would not reign over the people if they did not wish it. Very foreign concept. I'm going to take us into Cyrus the Great. And I think that Cyrus the Great is, well, as you pointed out before, he's an anomaly because you've got an ancient ruler who didn't get the title of the great by being a warlord didn't get the title of the great by being a warrior who went out and butchered millions cyrus the great is quite unusual in ancient times because he preaches a lot about tolerance and a lot about understanding and acceptance and puts himself out there as a ruler who wants to rule through peace a ruler who wants to rule in a way that was magnanimous, wanted to set up a, an, an eternal government, is really, I think, with most of these people, I think what you're actually going to find is that most of these people we've mentioned who referred to as the great, it's Cyrus they get their, their background from. Alexander the Great, for example, loved Cyrus the Great. He did a lot of reading on... Cyrus the Great when he was growing up he loved Cyrus the Great he he admired a lot of his principles he admired a lot of his qualities you know he's Cyrus the Great is is responsible in most most people will say that he's the father of the modern day charter of human rights um the thir you know, the 30 as as they are sometimes referred to as the the international you know the, the treaty on human rights he's responsible for that the the united nations makes no secret about the fact that that's a basis the american constitution has a large basis in a lot of the decrees of cyrus the great you know all the, the things about man and the rights of man um there's a lot of that um, thomas jefferson loved cyrus the great there's there's actually a, a lot of a there's a story about there's a that thomas jefferson has a copy of some of the original translations of cyrus and there's Cylinder. there's mark yeah there's marks made on them which sort of indicate where he really got a lot of his his information and a lot of his guidance um, on when he, before they were working on the declaration and things like that. When the the issue of human rights, or um, I think they were they were called was it called natural law? I think yep. at the time, yeah. Um, the issue of the history of rights is always going to be a played one, um, wherein human right let's just just use the name human rights for the history of it what constituted being quote unquote a human who was deserving of those rights changed over time without without question so even when thomas jefferson is writing what what are human rights he's saying well yes all these people who qualify as a human deserve rights except you know those slaves and and women don't necessarily deserve these rights and, and whatnot even in the time of cyrus um for as progressive as he was, um, not everyone got 
those rights. But to be the, at the position where you're now talking about giving rights or giving authority or autonomy from the top back down to the people, that is by far and away one of the most progressive things you could think of at the time. Yes, you might not be giving rights to everyone. Yes, you may still discriminate against people. However, the fact that you are thinking about reversing the arrow of authority and saying it doesn't always go up, but it actually sometimes goes down to you and you can make choices and you can make decisions, even if not everyone, that is by far and away the most progressive thing I think you'll find in that ancient, uh, outside of ancient Greece. Okay, so I think that it's, it's quite an interesting sort of look at, at, at revolutionary thinking um, for its time and indeed in some cases for, for, for today. I think the last part just on, on, on Cyrus before we move on is that Cyrus actually preached a lot of religious tolerance, which, you know, forget of its day. Today is quite often mm. something that's, that's forgotten. But, for example, in, in an era where everyone was anti-Semitic, um, Cyrus left... The, the Jewish people alone. And in fact, there's lots of quotes of him talking openly about the fact that if they're going to go and worship at their temples within cities, they should be allowed to do so. Um, I think Cyrus preached that quite quite strongly. Now, we're going to move on to our individual choices. Now, the trick with this is that we haven't told each other who we are considering for the title of the great. So I legitimately have no clue who Thomas is about to bring up. I, I don't know. I think I have a pretty good idea who you're... I think you're pretty certain who I'm going to bring up, but we're starting with you, so please, <laughs> take it away. Who is the great? I think when I tell you who my person is, it will reveal the kind of history I like to look at the most. My person is not a great military leader. They may have an influence on a military leader, but they're not a military leader, and that's because I personally don't value military leadership as much as other types of leadership and they are in fact an ancient person so just to break that that Ooh. trend uh you're in my realm now i have ventured backwards i have however ventured into a part of the world that i, I know you don't particularly have as in-depth a, a favoritism towards so it's not ancient egypt <laughs> it is going to taking us back to ancient greece though and my favorite parts of history is the history of ideas and the history of thinking and so consequently, I want to put forward the case for Plato the Great. Okay, I can see that. Let's go through it. He uh, gives us the ideas of Socrates, first of all. So straight away, he's just great for giving us a history of Socrates. He himself, however, was one of the great thinkers. He has a great relationship with Aristotle, who goes on to advise Alexander the Great. And consequently, we have the connection to Alexander the Great. So even... Uh, just his inference of knowledge and ideas uh, has such a far-reaching uh, sort of presence throughout his immediate time that there's certainly something to argue there. But without Plato, we don't have philosophy. We don't have great... Well, maybe after Plato, someone else would have, but we've got, we can point at Plato and say, there's the foundations of democracy. There's the foundations of... Uh, philosophy. There's the foundations of history. There's the foundations of academia. There's the foundations of how to make a better society. His five approaches to reaching uh, personal fulfillment, one of them is try and contribute to society in a good and meaningful way. If we all did that, we'd have no problems in the world. His, um, and maybe it's a bit of idealism on my side, but he lays the groundwork for a great society, which at various times throughout history, people draw back on, and we still draw on today. His ideas, his thinking, revolutionary for the time, and have impacted and echoed on throughout history, and I think it's Plato the Great. I, I may say you're a dreamer, and I'm not the only one. <laughs> um, no, I can, I can definitely see that argument. Plato, of course, does... does provide us with a foundation for a lot of, of thought, both from the ancient world and then in then present day. I can I can very much see that. Um, and I, I feel that that's quite quite a good choice actually. I'm 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 Yeah, I can get behind that choice. I'm I'm fairly certain I can get behind that choice. Okay. On to my choice. I'd I'd say drum roll, but anyone who actually knows me knows exactly where I'm going with this. Yes I'm going to Egypt. <coughs> 
you better believe I'm going to Egypt. Thomas just typed it in to get some background information. I haven't even said it, and he's brought it up, and it's 100% correct. My Year 7 class are all currently screaming at the podcast right now, going, it's a Hatshepsut, isn't it? It's so Hatshepsut. And you better believe it's a Hatshepsut. I believe personally that Hatshepsut should go down as Hatshepsut the Great. I think there's a number of reasons for... Hatshepsut being the great, and I personally count her as the great even to the advancement of Ramesses. Uh, I consider her greater than Ramesses. There are reasons. It's not just a case of, oh, she's my favourite and that's why I'm, I'm, I'm talking about this. With Hatshepsut, you've got just after the re-establishment of New Kingdom Egypt, so you've got the Hyksos have been there, um, the Egyptians have not run Egypt they come back in, then you get the Amos, and you get into Thutmose the first and her father, who's really establishes, re-establishes that new kingdom um, era. And then you go, so she's the daughter of the pharaoh. And for a long period of time, there are inscriptions and many different different accounts that he was actually okay with the idea that she was next in line, and he had talked this up. And there. Prior to even her writing, there are there are different accounts which indicate that he had written to say that she would be next in line to the throne. He then, of course, has a son with a, with a minor wife, Thutmose II, uh, and Hatshepsut does the normal duty of, of the first daughter, which is that she marries her half-brother to establish the bloodline as being strong because she is the daughter of the king and the queen, so she is a full-blood royal. Uh, marries Thutmose II, and, and there's a lot of evidence that seems to indicate that Hatshepsut was actually the power behind that throne. Thutmose II was sickly. Uh, he didn't seem to do a lot of his own governing. Hatshepsut did a lot of the decision-making. She was also the high priestess of the cult of Amun. That's very important because what Hatshepsut does in being the high priestess of the cult of Amun, she's dictating the religion of Egypt. She is in charge of the religion of Egypt. So she has a stronger understanding of Amun, the blessings of Amun, and the way that Egypt functions through that. Now, when Thutmose II dies, they don't have a son. They have a daughter, Neferure, but there's no son. He has a son with a minor wife, Thutmose III. But when, when Thutmose III is about to come to the throne, he's, he's you know probably about nine, we're looking at. So Hatshepsut does what every great royal wife does, which is that she acts as just the regent, and she's his chief advisor, except in year seven, where she suddenly proclaims herself as being pharaoh and uses the justification of being full royal blood, and she'd been chosen before, and this was just her taking control of what was rightfully hers. Now, some people look at this in the traditional viewpoint that had been put out by older historians was that she usurped the throne from Thutmose III, um, her stepson, Language plays a big part in the story of Hatshepsut. Um, the negative connotation uses the words like stepson. The positive connotation historians use nephew and, and those sorts of terms. It's very interesting how that plays out. Why is she the great? Well, there's a couple of reasons. First of all, Egypt goes into a prosperity overload in this period of time. There's no major conflicts. There's no major wars. The biggest building project of the New Kingdom era up to that point and, and up until Ramesses remaining pretty much so takes place. We're not just talking about a couple of buildings at Karnak, the big temple. We're talking about her mortuary temple at Der el-Bari, her mortuary temple of Jesse Jesseru, which was completely out of the ordinary in terms of stylistically. It was a, the most modern building in the world at that time. She builds the Valley of the Kings. She completely comes up with the idea, builds it directly behind her mortuary temple, expands it out mainly as a place to bury her father, but it begins there, and that is where, where then all of the central hub of the religion sort of comes to play. She adds to Karnak, builds the obelisks, which again is, is a single piece of stone. The idea of those, those sorts of out-there buildings, the Red Chapel, which is made of red quartzite, almost impossible to carve is not so much just to show off in terms of look at all this stuff but it's to show progress look what i can do nobody could carve this stone i can build a temple out of it nobody could build this sort of temple i've built a three-tiered temple made like this she goes back to the birthplace of the gods there's no rebellion think about it 
She's a ruler ruling with somebody else who was the ruler. He's off to one side, basically running the military on her behalf and learning how to be a ruler. And there's no rebellion. No one tries to usurp Hatshepsut at the time. There's no... There, there, even though the stories went out there about hatred and, and that Thutmose III possibly hated his, hated his aunt um, because she was removed from the temples... She was removed from the temples probably more, we now believe, because he just needs his bloodline to be next. There's no hatred in that. It's bloodline is the reason why she's removed from the temples. But Hatshepsut's achievements in terms of the amount of things that she built, the prosperity, she creates a standing army, the world's first standing army. So when she dies and Thutmose III takes over, there is a massive attempt to take advantage of the situation. And it is the fact that an army exists and they are a permanent standing army that allows Thutmose III to win his early military campaigns and defend Egypt and makes Egypt then into this military power. They're no longer just this sort of large nation state. They're now this huge military power because they've got a permanent army. You know, you can't just come in and invade anymore or try to sort of test the boundaries of Egypt. There's an army waiting for you. And this goes back to that idea of the Hyksos just claiming Egypt for, Egypt for themselves. I think that the scope of the building program, the riches of Egypt, which is still being seen even after, even after Akhenaten throws a large percentage of them away and building his own capital, the Ramesses and Setis are still looking back at that golden era, which is all based off the foundation of Hatshepsut. And again, to go back a little bit with Catherine, there's... No real, there have been female rulers in Egypt, but nobody of this stature, nobody with 20 years of rule behind them, um, nobody who just commanded so much respect and, and, and had such a complete control of the situation. Situation, And again, no power behind the throne. In, in fact, you could argue that again with Thutmose the second, she was the power behind the throne and she was the one who'd been making calls. She'd basically been a pharaoh all the way through her husband's reign. So I think really strongly that Hatshepsut probably does deserve the title of Hatshepsut the Great. Yeah, I wouldn't disagree, uh, except, no, no, no exception. The point that wins it for me is, or wins it for you, is that there was no other comparable female pharaoh. Mm. She is, to that point, the only uh, pharaoh who is a woman, extremely successful over a sustained period of time and fulfills the role and breaks the stereotype off this needs to be a man who does this that for me uh is is what does it now uh, in a modern era we sort of hail the coming of a first female prime minister in australia or the first president in america um will they go down as the great no probably because social conditions are very, very different. But to be the, f the first significant female pharaoh, not the first female pharaoh, but the first significant, successful, major uh, and lauded female pharaoh is the point that wins it for me. She broke a lot of what you might call rules or stereotypes or um, barriers to, to get to this point and then held on to that position without argument for, as you say, 20 years and, and does it great. And I think the interesting the interesting point for me with, with that too is that Breasted, the Egyptian um, historian, who doesn't particularly like her, it must be said, Breasted does comment that she's the first great woman in history of whom we are informed. Mm. And what he means by that is that we've got any real level of information about because, you know, one of, one of the great quotes about, about history and, and women's role in, in, in history traditionally is that for, for many years, Anonymous was a woman. And it's sort of true that you know wherever wherever there was a woman in history, traditionally it had been oh somebody did this, somebody did that. Um, Hatshepsut, and again, yes, there's her name is removed from temples, and they try to strike her from the record. But it's not even about being a woman; it's more about royal bloodline and the importance of royal succession. And Hatshepsut does get in the way of that. Um, that's that is the issue there. But you know the, the theories that used to go around about that that her stepson hated her the counterpoint to that being that if if the stepson had hated her he was in charge of the army mm. it's quite easy to have a 50 year old woman killed by the egyptian army if the other pharaoh is running the army it's mm. it's quite common also the fact that they appear in all of their um, depictions together and they're given joint titles so she doesn't completely usurp him 
Um, and it worked beautifully for him when he finally came into power. He'd had all this time of learning the army and learning Egypt and learning every element of it. So by the time he becomes pharaoh in his own right completely, he's very well suited to the job because of the groundwork that had already been done. So again, I think we've got some really interesting um, answers there. I'm actually going to put up on um, the, the, the Twitter, which I'll put a little link in the bio. I'm going to put a poll up about the, the people we've talked about today and who you consider to be the greatest of the greats. Um, we will include our options in there as well. I, look, I, I think actually that Plato's a very good call. I'm, I, I'm quite happy to get behind that one, I think, because Plato does indeed inform so much of, of, of the thought processes of the world. The reason I wanted to throw that out is because other than, <laughs> other than the three examples we've used, all of the greats uh, in, in ancient history just tend to be warlords and it glorifies the idea that you know to be a great person in history you must be good at war, you must be good at killing people. Well here's a person who made a mark not by killing but by thinking and using his brain and, and you know progressing the human condition or at least society by just thinking about things and um, without him we just don't have so much of what we take for granted today especially in the ways of logic and reasoning and public discussion. I mean, presidential debates uh, off the back of debating, which is off the back of Socratic uh, discussions, which is what he was subjected to uh, as a learning person. And we only know what that is because he recorded it. Uh, yeah, I just think he's a really important figure to note, um, primarily on the basis that you didn't need to be successful to kill people, if you, just by killing people. No, just killing people wasn't the... The necessary requirement. You yeah. need to tick that box. And with that in mind, I think we might leave this episode of the podcast right there. Uh, we will be back with you a lot faster than we were last time. We're going to do a couple of what we call in grab bag episodes, which are going to be very short bursts, very short questions. I've got a series of those sort of shorter answer questions. And we're going to be doing a couple of those little short burst episodes. So the, the hour 20 plus marathons that you sit through here and we thank you for sitting through those oh, yes. um, will be tempered by a couple of really sort of short sharp bursts feel free to send any questions through again I'll be putting the link to the um, the Twitter account into the bio so you can get you know contact us with any questions that you particularly want to ask as well um, why let year 7 have all the fun yes. so um, with that in mind I'd like to thank Thomas again for, for being here today and I think I'd like to finish off with probably my, my favourite phrase of the day which I think remains enlightened absolutism. Um, so with that in mind, we will catch you on the flip side.